everyone. My name's uh, Andy Langley. I'm from the University of York. I'm a master's student. I'm Izzy Wisher. Um, I did my master's at York, but I'm now a PhD student at Durham University. So we're going to very quickly run through this, hopefully less than 10 minutes. So overview, do a quick introduction to what we've been doing in our work with antler working. Um, we'll take a scientific approach, look at the theoretical approach, what are the problems with both of those, try and sort of meld them together using experimental archaeology, try and draw some brief conclusions. Yeah, um, so it's going to be quite rapid and just sort of sparking a discussion, hopefully, that will tie into the discussion later. Um, so to give a bit of background for us, um, our interest in um, antler working was sort of sparked through um, a module we both did last year in experimental archaeology where we were reproducing um, Neolithic antler picks from, um, I think it was based on Grimes graves. Um, and it was more to make a kind of educational video for Jorvik, as you can see us filming there. Um, and we tried to uh, explore some interesting um, hypotheses when we were working the antler. So we uh, looked at breakage patterns and the different ways you can um, break and work antler. Um, and then did a, a very small experiment where we soaked antler for a week just to observe what happened. Um, but didn't really take that any further and then noticed that we had some interesting observations and decided, yeah, to go further with it. Yeah, so we carried on working outside of um, our module <coughs> and we, um, we sort, of, sort of went through a journey of how to carry on our work in breaking antler and how sort of antler is worked more broadly. And we ended up looking at uh, soaking patterns or how to incorporate soaking antler into a sort of chan repertoire. And so, yeah, over the last year, that's really been our, our focus. Um, so we, we looked at, we tried to use sort of scientific approaches and theoretical approaches and that, because of that, that's how we've ended up sort of in this, in this conversation. So very, very quickly, if you're going to take a scientific approach to antler working, um, I could stand here for hours and talk about the philosophy of science, but just to pick out a few sort of salient points. So the scientific sort of approach, you need to have a sort of an idea of universal principles. So if antler, if you can work antler, antler must break or be worked in the same place in the same way at all times in all places. So antler is a sort of consistent material. Um, so there must be some sort of universal principles that underlie how antler works. Um, so that's sort of the first thing. And then you would have to use the scientific method, obviously, if you're going to work it um, and try and get some kind of metric data out of it. The problem with approaching it from this angle and we looked at originally sort of whether you could do stress test patterns mm -hmm. on breaking antler putting them through different sort of machinery to, to find if there was a an exact amount of force that was required if you soaked antler um, to see whether it would break but the problem with that is it doesn't tell you very much about the actual cultures and the people who worked the antler there um, in any sort of specificity so you could say antler breaks in this way but that's quite a universal claim it doesn't really help you get to how did people in the neolithic break it so there may be an optimal way to break antler but that may not be have anything to do with how people uh, originally approached it yeah and then um as a sort of contrast to that um we realized there's a lot of uh theory and um understandings of antler more conceptually so there's, there seems to be this assumption that there's um, an increasing sophistication in antler working throughout prehistory. Um, assuming that the earliest evidence of antler working we have, um, of antler hammers at Boxgrove, for example, uh, is very primitive. Um, and as you go through time, it gets increasingly more sophisticated. Um, and you have the pinnacle of antler working is in the Neolithic. Um, and I'll come back to this point because we found that not to be the case. Um, and it's, it seems to be this issue within theoretical uh, narratives about antler working, of trying to impose um, preconceived ideas of how we think uh, prehistory is formed, how we think uh, tool making more broadly um, should be in prehistory. So we're imposing this sort of evolutionary narrative that things go from simple to complex. Um, which I'm sure most people in the room will appreciate that's not the case. Um, and there are more nuanced understandings of antler working 
where they try to explore um, Chanel Coutoise, for example. But again, this is imposing um, a set of stages that are preconceived, um, admittedly based on evidence from the archaeological record, but it's not explored <coughs> further than that um, in terms of the properties of antler. Or perhaps trying to think of the cultural significance of antler, um, but this is quite uh, generalist. So the problem we have in theoretical approaches um, is this trying to impose these preconceived ideas without an appreciation of antler as a material um, and as a property. So I imagine we can take issue with this table, but this roughly gives you an idea of, of the two sort of approaches here. So you've got the scientific on the left, theoretical approach on the right. So if you're going to take a scientific approach, <coughs> you assume that what you're talking about is real. So antler is a, is a real thing, it must have real properties. Um, the way you would look at it is through an empirical study. Um, you would use observation, you would use the skeptical scientific method to approach it. Um, you would subject your ideas to experimentation. And so the takeaway message for that is that using that can lead to a lack of appreciation for the specific culture that then work, that was working at that. Um, and on the opposite approach, uh, if you can use the theoretical, it's, so theories are quite instrumentalist, so they, they they, they are useful and then you do something with them and then you can drop them. You're not assuming that your theory is actually true, unlike the kind of the realist approach of, of a scientist. Um, they're rational, so you, you think up an idea and you impose it downwards. Um, and then, so you're imposing preconceived ideas. They can be quite general and so that leads to a lack of appreciation of the actual material, the materiality of what you're working with. So if nothing else, just to take away those two points, lack of appreciation for culture, lack of appreciation for materiality. So how do we solve this issue between the two different um, approaches? Well, we found uh, for, from our own experience that experimental archaeology sort of brings together quite naturally um, these two aspects. Um, grounding your understanding in the materiality of antler. So this is, um, has been researched previously um, through uh, other experimental studies in antler working. Um, and it meant that we could have this appreciation for the scientific and the theoretical and um, bring those two together when we're working with the antler. Um, and it, it means we get some more uh, nuanced insights into antler working more broadly. So as uh, a few slides back, um, the graph that showed sort of a increasing sophistication, assuming um, the antler hammers from box grove are very simplistic mm, and they can do. Um, yeah, and the Neolithic antlerpics are sophisticated. We found that actually it's very easy to produce Neolithic antlerpics. You just remove the tines, which is much more easy to do than uh, cutting through the beam, which is what's happening at Boxgrove, um, where they're cutting through the beam of the antler, which is a much more dense material. Um, and uh, in the paper actually by Staff et al. about the uh, Boxgrove antler hammers, they say that it's um, they simply say that it's uh, produced through direct percussion. If you try and work with antler, you know that you can't directly percuss it and it will break. You know, it's a very hard, difficult material to work. Um, so it's that better appreciation for that. So within our own work, um, we were able to explore how soaking can improve the workability of antler by exposing well, by having an appreciation for the materials. So Antler has this structure where the interior is quite spongy. Um, and if you expose that spongy interior um, and soak it, that will retain the water for longer and make it much more uh, easy to work. So it's that, it's that depth of appreciation for understanding the material. Um, yeah. Yeah, so in conclusion then, um, we, we're using experimental archaeology as a bridge to um, integrate both scientific and theoretical approaches. Um, so it allows, if you're taking the scientific approach, it allows you to ground it in sort of specific cultures. And if you're taking the theoretical approach, it allows you to appreciate the materiality a bit better. Um, and that would be a straightforward conclusion within 10 minutes. <laughs> Very quickly. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Uh, yeah.